Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this third day of our webinar series with uh, Pediatric Adolescent Treatment Africa, PATA, uh, in their regional summit. Um, this is uh, part of UNICEF's uh, learning collaborative efforts to synthesize and share evidence from, pra from practitioners, from partners, in order to shape policy and improve the HIV response. So we're glad you could make time in your busy schedules to join us. Um, it is the third day of the regional summit of PATA. PATA is a network of uh, practitioners working on uh, pediatric HIV in Africa. And so we're very honored to be here today to share some of the uh, exciting pres presentations and evidence that we've heard um, at this meeting. Before I introduce our speakers um, and our co-moderator, I just wanted to review a few housekeeping issues. First is um, if you have trouble hearing or if the audio quality is not optimal, please uh, try logging in and out of the call first or restarting your computer. The audio will always be much improved if you use headphones, so we highly recommend that. Um, also, please just let us know where you're calling in from and where you work. This gives us a sense of who our audience is and who's interested in, in these webinars and so we can respond to your needs. So kindly type in that information as we go. Um, I'm Jessica Rodriguez from UNICEF and I'm honored to have here with me Kate Harrison. Some of you may know her, she used to uh, work for the Children's Investment Foundation Fund and now she is with AVERT in the UK. So we are very happy to have her dynamic presence here with us co-moderating. And um, we have a total of five, presenta five presentations today. Um, the sequence of the webinar is that we will have two presentations and break for Q&A, and then we will hear the next three presentations and also have time for Q&A. All of the presentations and the recording of the webinar will be distributed following uh, the webinar later on today. Uh, so thank you again, and I will introduce our first speaker. We're very excited to have Noren Huni here, who holds a master's degree in adult education and a health and adult education degree from the University of Zimbabwe. She has 25 years of work experience. She is currently the CEO for the Regional Psychosocial Support Initiative, or RESPI, a 13-country regional NGO that aims to provide leadership, knowledge development, and quality technical assistance in psychosocial support for children and youth affected by poverty. And before that, um, she has worked for various uh, organizations, and she also leads an Early Childhood Development World Forum Foundation Voices of Hope Project on Children and HIV AIDS, um, and is also part of the WHO Civil Society Reference Group on HIV AIDS. Today's theme at the conference was care. Um, so Dr. Huni will be um, talking about improving retention in childhood, the power of family and community. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Nomi. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you, Katana, and thank you, Yusuf, for providing me with this opportunity. Um, Red City does a beautiful work in the region. But the focus is in head, it's about care. And I'm choosing to say more specifically focus on early childhood development first and how we can retain children. That's an outline of how I'm choosing to say the goal. We will start with by a brief of the group, not much time on that, but also really looking at the context and what we're looking at. Read this very easily and understanding how the brain operates.
Okay, we we know that you can't hear Noreen. Can you hear her now? Can you hear me now? Also threatening to hear. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I hope we can continue. So on the next slides, we we actually now at a point where we're talking about what REPSI does and what are the four main interrelated components of REPSI work. Basically, it's about capacity building, it's about advocates, it's about actually helping mainstreaming into the social health and education services. But more importantly is an issue about collecting and creating knowledge as well as disseminating, sharing what works, what doesn't work. Uh, next slide. For this presentation, whilst we told you we were talking about pre-primary school, I'll try and spend a bit of time on the first 1,000 days of life. And again, this is pregnancy up to two years. These are critical Type, times of the child in the sense that this is a time when the child's brain is quite sponge and it is time when the brain is able to absorb a lot of learning. So when this is happening, we need to be able to provide the greatest support to the child so that we capitalize on the child's development. In this case, what we're then saying is we need to be sensitive about not doing damage in the first 1,000 days of life. As we've also learned from the evidence that we have, it really has issues when we do not provide enough for the child. What happens is this has, it has many aspects, but if it's not done well, it can actually affect the child's life going forward in terms of the productivity and everything that goes with it. Sorry, it seems like uh, it's not moving forward. Okay, so, so this one. And so, when let's go into the, this slide. When we're now looking at the areas where the children are most limiting, it's the health, like we said, the education, in this case, we'll focus on the early childhood phase. But these areas of service are also interfacing with the families in the communities, the caregivers, and the parents. Right. And so it is very, very important that there is linkages between these critical elements of service provision. If it is the child is in the early childhood development, how are we connecting the child with the families? And if we do so, it means there is reinforcement of messages, there is reinforcement of practices that we think will help with the stimulation of the child for both cognitive learning as well as the child's development. At the critical time for us to provide that stimulation and responsive health services is very, very critical. And in other words, we're saying we must start as early as possible and provide that nurturing care and support. Let's therefore look at the way the brain operates. This is about the brain when it is faced with adversity. And we're using the maternal brain here because we're talking about early childhood development. But this happens to any caregiver, any parent, to anyone. So let's look at the caregiver from the mother's point of view. The brain functions in such a way that it has the top, which is called the prefrontal cortex, and we can refer in this presentation as the top brain. And this prefrontal is responsible for the thinking, the planning, the creativity. That's what that part of the brain does. That's what it is responsible for, right? And if we then look at what that part of the brain does, it helps to make the most favorable conditions. This is the brain part that is responsible for timing. Let's look at the other part of the bottom part of the brain, which is the subcortex part of the brain which is the bottom, as we can refer it into this process. This is the one that automatically and very rapidly is good at detecting and responding to threats. And when that happens, it's either, can I fight? Can I fly, run away, or can I freeze? So given that we realize 
that is the mode of the brain that is responsible for the survival. That element is very important for us. So, next slide. In life, all of us, throughout our lives, we're forever really working with the subconscious. It never stops asking these questions. Am I safe? Am I safe? So let's look at this and think about it in the context of the caregiver, as well as the children and the services that they have. So if the brain gets the response that, well, I'm not safe, the mode that comes in, the response for the brain is actually entirely quite different, right? And let's look at a situation which has, you know, abundance of resources, which is safe, which is a predictable environment, which is the next slide, in a situation where you've got a predictable environment, the brain then regulates the top down is the one that actually comes in. And that part of the brain, it suppresses bottom up modes, right? So in this case, you find that the individual is able to think, they're able to plan, they're being creative. They in a way, see the bigger picture. They think first, they act later. And they, this is the part of the brain that helps with the issues of keeping your head actually thriving. It helps one to thrive. And so understanding that is very important. That one needs to ensure that part of that act brain mode is active. Let's look at the bottom mode, how they operate. So with the bottom mode, once the bottom mode is in motion, it's tricky. Is it harsh environment? Is it unsafe environment? Is it predictable? Again, we look at this from the community, from the service provision, from a personal perspective, the brain is asking the bottom-up approach brain, it gets into this fight, fight, and freeze. And it replaces the thinking, the planning, and the creativity. And so once that happens, you find that um, the individual begins to look at, to see the small picture. They want to act first. They want to survive. They can think later. But they want to act first. They want to survive. Now we've seen these two different Visions of how the brain operates. Let's look then at, in terms of building resilience, we want to build resilience so that these individuals, these families, can also support the children to retain in care. We realize safe environment, favorable conditions, that's the top-down mode of the brain. It brings resilience. Great. Let's look at the other. The unsafe environment, the adverse conditions, the top, bottom up aspect or mode of the brain, it comes in play. It also helps to develop resilience, which is great. But just in the next slide, what we've tried to do is to summarize how the bottom up approach works and the top-down mode of the brain works. And we realize that in situation where it is favorable environment and the thinking and the creativity happens, resilience on both sides. But resilience in a situation where it is the top up, you find that it is more retained. Now, when you look at this other situation where much of it, what is happening, is really the bottom up approach. The resilient is there. The resilient is not for retention. And so, what we realize is the bridge, the value of ongoing, continuous psychosocial support that helps to replace the survival and move towards thriving. And in this case, it's important for us to realize that the ones of uh, processes of psychosocial care, provision interventions, they don't work. What works is ongoing support. There are no quick fixes when it comes to the issues of psychosocial support. So with that in mind, let's move a step further and look at the primary caregiver. 
And in this case, our primary caregiver is the mother. Um, sadly, in our context, the mothers, just by realizing I have HIV, this is a long, lifelong treatment process. They are concerned about the diagnosis. They are concerned about the myths and misconceptions that arise just by knowing your diagnosis. The issues around access to social health, education, and for them to survive. The issues around socioeconomic processes, where do I get the money, what are the transport? The social issues around stigma, discrimination, withdrawal, all those issues, they become into play. The feelings, these are the issues that a caregiver, whom we want to be able to support the child, is going through. We, this is the person who is helping us to make sure that the child stays in treatment. The child stays both on care for early childhood development as well as in the treatment programs. So at the back of our mind, how do we get the primary caregiver to stay on track with the child despite all these challenges? And for us, her psychosocial and mental well-being is critical enabler for retention. We also realize that one of the critical things that caregivers do struggle with is around disclosing. And when that happens, it affects the way they are able to support the children. But we have learned that communities and communi communities and families are really taking charge and they're supporting families. We get to a point where what is it that the communities need for them to be able to support and the issues of disclosure come in. However, what we need to look at is the issues around social protection services strengthening. They actually strengthen the top down mother power that is usually left untapped because of it's the non-tangible things. But what we're saying is, let us strengthen the social protection for this mother and baby pair. And once we've done that, we also need to realize that our children still need issues of protection and services. And once they know that it's important, in most of our context, the villages begin to pick that this is our child mode. And they begin to look at, making early childhood development a priority in their region. But we must ensure that we are also linking the services to services, the compartmentalization of the health on its own, the families on its own, it's making us lose many children from fall up, both from an early childhood development as well as from the health perspective. We must be able to link with the families they are with the service providers, formal service providers for shorter times. Most of the time, they are in the families where there's an adult. It could be an elder sibling, it could be a father, it could be a grandparent, it could be a primary caregiver of any net. But we must be able to support this. One of the things that we realize in communities that helps the communities develop a sense of hope is if they learn about survivors. When we are having programs that are giving us good results, we need to be able to celebrate the successes with the communities, particularly for those families that have disclosed and they have got children that are thriving. I think instead of just concentrating on, well, the child had HIV, the child died, the child had HIV, there are plenty of cases where the children are living well, the children are thriving, and those become models for the communities, areas where they can hold on and see the hope for ensuring that this child grows into adulthood. And in REPSI, we therefore use quite extensively the gen of life social community mobilization process. We use this to be able to tap on the community capital, the human capital within the community. And we realize that the community itself is very important in supporting the parents and the children to stay in treatment. Uh, we have experienced aspects of community parenting 
which is the ability for the community to realize that those children who need support and what is it that they could do, particularly when it comes to teen parents. We also have this using the community as a social support uh, net, which can actually help us to interrogate the positive customs and traditions that help us to support the parents. In my community, you find that when a new mother has just had a baby, the community elder women would come and support with household chores, with firewood and all that. Those elements of support, they take away unnecessary stressors to the mother for survival and they help to augment the mood for, survival, for thriving. Resilient families and communities in our situation have realized that they can actually deliver positive change for children and they will support keeping and making sure the children remain in care. What else is it that we have learned over the years that we've been working? I will repeat this. Psychosocial support is not a quick fix. It is ongoing for sustained well-being. And that is very important for engagement and funding around programming. If you want quick fix, yes, it will happen, but you probably will be doing more harm to the children's psychosocial and mental well-being. Again, we realize that the early childhood development phase it gives us the greatest opportunity for enhanced outcomes. We're talking here about a child who is receiving early stimulation, early learning. The overall growth and development is all much better than a child who is not getting that. So when we have health, early childhood development, families that are not working together, it's a leaking system. And we need to be able to close those gaps by ensuring that there is coordination. Again, when you look at the issues of valuing and understanding families, social environments, it's very, very important. It helps us to understand the context where this parent is coming from and how we can refer them to other systems to alleviate those environmental stressors. Again, we should emphasize the role of the family. We should now be talking, in my view, for family-based approach, for family-based care for families affected by AIDS, for us to be able to reach those children who are affected by HIV and AIDS. It's very important. But in the final analysis, what we're also looking at is, but who is providing the support to the primary caregivers? We know the primary caregivers are getting onto the children, but who is providing support to the primary caregivers? We need to be able to support the workforce so that when we're talking about psychosocial care and support, they understand the implications and they understand the values and they know how to do it. So we should be able to provide that as much as possible. Again, starting early as much as possible is very important. We realize that as long as we're talking about psychosocial care and support, particularly for children and the younger, it's even worse, it's best provided by the families, within the families and within their communities. Whilst we may have off family or uh, institution-based kind of support, it has to keep linking back to the family so that there is that continuous reinforcement of messages, of behaviors, of positive attitudes within the family. And that helps to retain individuals to retain in treatment. Again, we realize it's the day-to-day -day caring activities that help as much as possible, the ways of life, of caring. Do you have a positive attitude? Are you showing concern? Is it unconditional love? Is it non-judgmental? Those are some of the things that I think the service provisions have been struggling with. When we do that, we don't realize how the mother-baby pairs, they begin to be lost to fall up or they begin to change their addresses. So we need to provide that safe space for them, institutions as well as at home. The life course development, uh, some of the things that we have observed that are beginning to happen. We, we need, again, to find out a little bit more evidence about that. What is happening? When they were a child, they knew about the HIV status. We had disclosed 
and hence linking back to the first 1,000 days of life and building a firm base for continuous development requirement. But as the children are also developing and their circumstances changes, their location changes, it's not always when they've disclosed that they want their status knows, known as they grow. And so that's an area where we think we still need to strengthen and find more ways of making it work. Um, by way of acknowledgement, I wish to really acknowledge the work that is being done by Dr. Barak Morgan from the University of Cape Town. He's been engaging with us and beginning to help us to understand the neuroscience behind how parents and how individuals react when they are faced with challenges, but also to acknowledge members of staff from REPSI, Lynette Mutekunye, Supusisue Marunda, and Charisma, who have really helped in presenting and supporting the preparation for this presentation. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Noreen, for your presentation, talking about resilience and integrating the neuroscience and how we can um, support uh, and strengthen programs that combine both early childhood development and HIV. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Ruth Henward, who is from, the, from WITS, the Reproductive Health and HIV Institute of South Africa. Um, so as uh, I load her presentation, please be patient. And Ruth will speak about youth care clubs. So over to you, Ruth. Thanks. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, so yeah, I'm Ruth Hammond. I'm a researcher with the WITS Reproductive Health and HIV Institute, I'm part of the Adolescent Innovations Project. And I'm just going to share some of our experiences in implementing youth care clubs. So I'd like to introduce you to Bongi. She's a 17-year-old HIV-positive adolescent. Um, she's been on art for four months. And once a month, she goes off to the clinic. She has to um, miss school for the day. She goes to the clinic to see the nurse and collect her ARVs. Um, and she does not look forward to these visits. There's no privacy at the clinic. Everyone sees her and there's a lot of judgment. Sometimes she can wait uh, more than four hours and then she still has to remind the nurse to take a viral load and creatinine um, and the nurse doesn't even bother asking her how she's feeling. So Bongi needs differentiated care, but why does she need this care? Um, well, because she's an adolescent, right? We all know how challenging um, the time of life ad adolescents can be for anyone. And when you throw a stigmatized chronic illness into the mix, the challenges simply multiply. Adolescents and youth living with HIV require continuity of care, and they also need uh, extra support to link to and be retained within that care. But as we all know, these services need to be delivered differently to this population. They have higher rates of virologic failure, and there's been an increase in HIV AIDS related deaths in this population. So clearly the status quo standard of care is not an option and we need to look um, at addressing the unique and complex adherence needs in the way that we provide them with services. So WITS RHI has been implementing youth care clubs or YCCs for just over a year now. We've adapted the, the model from the MSF youth club model and we've looked at including um, scalability and replicability um, um, in the public health care sector. So what are YCCs? If you can just imagine this closed group of 20 adolescents and youth living with HIV, um, they are grouped according to age, but all are at different stages in the HIV journey. Um, some YCC members are new on art, some are virally suppressed on art, and some, hopefully very few, are not yet virally suppressed on art. Okay. So the YCCs are run by a lay counsellor and they're supported by a clinician, typically in South Africa that's a nurse, who have both attended a four hour long YCC training. The YCC counsellor and clinician provide members access to integrated clinical and psychosocial support at monthly meetings where members receive HIV clinical management, contraception, pre-packed art refills, routine health screening and psychosocial support in one quick visit. They meet monthly 
for the first uh, 12 months and thereafter the group can decide whether they want to continue meeting monthly or if they want to start meeting every two months. So what do these monthly meetings look like? Um, there are three stages um, of a YCC visit, which is designed to last no longer than one to two hours. So um, in the first stage, um, we see members arriving at the club. The YCC counselor will weigh them, conduct a basic screening around the TV STIs, for example, um, confirm the phone number of the young person, because we found that the phone numbers are always changing, and then record this data in a special YCC register. It's a paper register. After that, the YCC Council will give the, um, the, the member their next appointment date on a special YCC appointment card. Um, the, at the second stage, the YCC Council will start off with a quick, fun icebreaker before they facilitate an inter a 45-minute interactive discussion. Um, it's a group discussion, and it's, um, it's always based on a youth-relevant topics such as sexual health or relationships. And there is a topic guide that we've developed that counsellors can use to guide them. Then the third and final um, stage of the YCC visit is when the pre-packed art is um, distributed to the YCC members. Um, and those that need to see the YCC clinician are fast-tracked to do so. Any member who's screened positive for any of the screening questions or who needs contraception is also fast-tracked to see the YCC clinician. Um, so when it comes to art, the pre-packed art distribution, the YCC counsellor will distribute the pre-packed art to all the stable and virally suppressed uh, members right there in the club room, and then they can leave to go home. Um, and those youth that are new on treatment or not yet virally suppressed will then be fast-tracked, as I said, to see the YCC clinician who will um, issue their pre-packed meds and do a quick clinical checkup. So the, um, oh, and then also what happens is that the YCC clinician will also record the visit in each patient's file, and then those files are taken to the clinic's data capturers, who then capture onto the electronic monitoring system. Um, so the, the uh, session that I just described to you is a standard, it's a routine session. Um, once a year, all the virally suppressed YCC members have their bloods drawn for routine viral load testing. One of the benefits to aligning club members' viral loads in this way is that it helps to ensure viral loads um, are not missed and that everyone has their viral loads annually as they're supposed to. This blood visit is then followed, the following month is, is uh, followed by a clinical visit, which is when members receive their results and um, you know have a private one-on-one -on -one, um, consultation with their nurse. They get their results and discuss their clinical needs, celebrate low viral loads and discuss possible reasons behind high viral loads. And that happens once a year. Benefits of, a, of the Youth Care Club are many. <laughs> um, so firstly, YCCs are quick. There's no queuing. The art is pre-packed a day before. Secondly, they're youth friendly. They are run by um, a lay counsellor who is a young adult themselves and specially trained to keep visits fun and engaging. Thirdly, they're a one-stop shop. So as I said, it's integrated clinical and psychosocial support um, um, and it also includes contraception, all in one visit. YCCs, fourthly, are also healthcare worker friendly. So um, by seeing everyone in a group, we can decongest the clinic waiting areas. And it also means that the nurse um, doesn't have to see um, all those virally suppressed members every month or every two months just to issue their meds. You know, she or he only sees them once a year for their clinical and, and blood visits, which uh, takes the pressure off them and gives them more time to see the unwell patients. Uh, fifthly, the YCC is widened the peer support network for their members. So members are grouped, um, you know, similar age groups are grouped together and they're encouraged to engage with one another and um, discuss interesting, uh, have interesting debates and discussions and that is aimed at fostering sort of like a, you know, peer support and a sense of belonging. And then lastly, um, uh, but very importantly, is that the YCCs offer an opportunity for smooth transition from adolescent into adult care. Because what happens is that this YCC group will actually just age together as a group and eventually become an adult adherence club, um, which helps with continuity of care. So we're in the evaluation phase at the moment. We don't have much data to share. Um, but what we do have is just a quick snapshot look at 325 YCC members. At six months, um, we found 88% retention in care. 
and 75% retention in YCC care specifically. Um, and then um, we're looking at 81% of our YCC members being virally suppressed at their last viral load. So it's looking promising and um, evaluation is ongoing as we scale up the model. Of course, there are some challenges um, and, you know, the challenge will, will be context specific, but in our context, refreshment, you know, is a problem for a lot of the young people. Food and security and malnutrition is a reality. Um, they're coming after school, they're hungry. So as Vits RHI, we're able to provide them with a modest snack, but when it comes to hand over to Department of Health, that's not exactly a very really sustainable um, way of doing things. So that's a, that is a challenge. Clinic, rigid clinic hours are also a problem. Um, our facilities don't work, um, I don't have extra hours, I don't work on Saturdays. So the clubs, we're having to hold the clubs on, most of them on a Friday afternoon, which is when school leaves early in our context. But there's only four or five Fridays in a month. And um, as we scale up, that's becoming more and more challenging. Then in terms of staffing, while the model is aimed at, um, it doesn't require any extra staff. So it uses existing counselors in the clinic, existing clinicians in the clinic. Um, so from that perspective, it's, it, it's not an issue. But what we're finding is that the staff in the clinic um, have all sorts of challenges in terms of working with adolescents and youth. Um, they're not trained um, to do so. They don't feel capacitated. They don't feel confident to work with adolescents and youth. They don't feel that they have the energy to work with them. Um, and also we have task shifting issues. So we'll train some people at the clinic and then we'll find that they've moved on to a different service or a different facility and we have to train all over again. And so that continuity is not, um, at the moment, is, is, is a bit problematic. Space is also an issue. Um, a YCC needs to meet in a, in a closed, uh, confidential, relatively quiet space, you know, somewhere where you can close the door and this group of 20 can sit in a circle and discuss things without fear of being heard outside. And not all facilities have that space, and that is problematic. And then in terms of the frequency of visits, so as I said, um, initially the clubs meet once a month. Um, and then after 12 months, they can choose to start meeting every two months. And the whole aim of that was to sort of foster, um, you know, uh, peer support and um, make sure that everyone gets to know each other, feels comfortable with each other, that there's trust, that they develop trust with each other. And then after 12 months, they can start to meet less frequently. Um, but the problem with that is that we're struggling then to recruit some stable, virally suppressed youth and adolescents to the clubs because they're used to coming every two or three months to the clinic and now we're asking them to come every month and that's not ideal for them for obvious reasons. But at the same time, there's such an important source of um, learning and inspiration for those that are new and not yet virally suppressed. So we're really trying to find a way to balance, um, to balance that as well. And just to end with um, some <laughs> uh, positive quotes about from our youth club members. So they enjoy coming to the clinic to see their progress and talk to the nurse. Um, they like being there with their peers, talking about their fears and expressing how they feel. Um, and they like getting their medication quickly. They like that they don't have to wait in a queue anymore. Um, and so for us, these are really valuable um, and signs of success. Finally, just to acknowledge the Youth Care Club facilitators do a fantastic job. They're amazing individuals. Um, the program manager, uh, Shanaz Pahad, and also, of course, the members of the YCCs. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. So um, we've just had two speakers and we're we are now about to have our, it's Kate Harrison speaking here from Avert, by the way. Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar. We, 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 we do have a little bit of time for questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll find a way of managing those. Um, if you type any questions you have now, um, and then we'll see if we can find some time at the end to um, to answer those questions. But what I'd like to do now is move over to our group um, of young people that are going to speak about their experiences. Um, so, okay. thank you, Kate. So, um, with us now is Lubega Kisa from ISS Mulago in Uganda and Grace. In Gulube from Zalewa Clinic in Malawi, and they will be speaking about beyond peer support, clinic engagement with young people living with HIV. So give us one second as we load the presentation. Okay. 
So we're very excited to have uh, uh, Lou Vega and Grace with us, uh, young people who will speak about uh, peer support. And over to them. Thank you very much. I'm Lou Vega Kiza from Uganda, and my colleague Grace will be joining me soon. Uh, we are going to talk about peer support building resilience in different areas. Yeah, in, in this presentation, we have uh, peer support in the clinic. What are they and what are they, they are doing? Peer support are the treatment adherence supporter, uh, community treatment supporter, and expert client. And when you look to the definition, uh, engaging in delivering support services at the clinic, promoting retention, here is a viral suppression linked to the care. It's also a package to youth-friendly service when you want to uh, deliver youth-friendly services at the clinic level. What are their role? Today, I'm going to focus only for four areas. That's counseling, information and education, uh, clinic services, and psychosocial support. Uh, in in uh, counseling, we have one-on-one -on -one and group counseling. When you go to information and education, you have health education talk, sharing materials, and many more. Clinic services, we have clinic management flow, triaging, uh, information, as, uh, and assistance, nursing, and creating a space for young people. Uh, when you go to psychosocial support, we have home, home visit, uh, a lot to follow up so that we can re retain our adolescent in care and uh, run the activity for young people. Uh, why we are here today, we are talking about uh, uh, beyond peer supporters. We want to sensitize sensitization for a uh, health provider, adult, uh, to adolescent concerns, barriers, experiences, and to provide hopeful information, feedback to service providers so that they can improve the services. And also to link our young people to network structures for youth-led activities and other services in the community. Yes, Grace, you can take over. Thank you very much, Rubiga. Um, I would like to concentrate on recruit on how we recruit, train, and support peer supporters. Firstly, in recruit, our, a good peer supporter should be hardworking and committed to, to work with young people, 18 to 25 years old, virally suppressed and fully disclosed. The peer supporter is selected by the healthy care providers and peers. The needs of to train and support the peer supporters supportive and interested clinic or community partner, enabling environment, for example, training, information and space, create job description, scope of working with regular clinic supervision, acknowledgement and recognition, involvement in meetings, stipend to support levels and basic necessities, access to opportunities for skill building, personal personal growth and career development or, or promotion. Challenges we face as peer supporters, how to integrate into health systems or community, high like in clinic, peer supporters are not always a, a priority. Limited resources to support ranges of, of activities required, not, not critical not critiqued in the healthy system, future prospects and opportunities for growth, lots of responsibilities with limited support. Successes in peer supporting. As peer supporters, we are given, we are given opportunities to learn, how skill, to learn new skills, attend meetings and trainings, Increase the levels of disclosure, less stigma and discrimination, friend their health providers. Adolescents, more, adolescents are more comfortable to speak. Clinics feel, clinics feel safer for young people in a way that there is improved retention for young people, improved adherence, and in 
re increased levels of vinyl load suppression amongst young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Grace and Hubega. Uh, up next is Kelvin Makura, who um, is a graduate of the University of Zimbabwe, and he's a passionate youth advocate, and he works with um, the Young People Network, Network of People Living with HIV in Zimbabwe, and he will talk about um, many of the adolescent-focused projects that he's working on. So please be patient as we load his slides. And we will break for a Q&A after his presentation. So over to you, Kelvin. OK. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin Budakwashi Makura. I'm from the Global Network of Young People Living with HIV. Uh, in my country, I work for an organization that is named Zimbabwe Young Positives, which is a national network of young people who are actually living with HIV. So. Um, on this presentation, I'm actually looking at the youth that are the, on the front line in service delivery. Uh, what, are the, what are the issues that we actually see and face and how we can actually help each other in addressing these issues and how young people are working in the communities to address the issues and well-being of young people. So we are saying as young people, we have got um, so much potential. We have got energy. Uh, we have got ideas and we have lived the experiences. So we want to learn, gain uh, professional experience, and develop ourselves. By so saying this, we actually mean that we, uh, we are actually unlimited as young people because we have got so many ideas that can actually influence change and development in our communities. And we also want to actually be professionals, be understood, and work in our full efforts so that we can actually develop ourselves. What can we do to assist in service delivery? We can play many roles as, you, um, I, as we understand, because we are young people, we are still energetic. And also in our communities, we can act as adolescent treatment supporters. In my country, we call them cats, um, who are actually peer supporters, who go day to day um, visiting young people who are in the communities and also addressing the issues of sexual reproductive health and adherence as counselors in these communities. We are also educators where we actually talk about health issues and treatment literacy because we understand that as young people we have got challenges and uh, when we are taking medication or you are taking um, antiretroviral therapy, it's actually very important for you to actually know why you're taking the treatment, what kind of treatment that you're taking, and how you actually live a sustainable life without uh, harming yourself. And we also know that um, we can actually be uh, agents of, of services. We can actually do condom distribution, lubrication distributions. Um, with these services, we understand we are a diverse group of young people, but um, it's a challenge. Um, for some of us, for example, if you are coming from a key population community, it's difficult to actually ask for lubricants to some people who are not coming from that same community because of um, the language and terminology that people use. And we also, as young people, facilitate support groups. Um, these are safe spaces where young people meet each other and talk about issues, day-to-day um, -day issues, sexual reproductive health, and rights. And actually making friends, because we understand it's actually very important for young people to have friends so that they can share issues, stories, and even some of them, if they are fortunate, they can actually have real relationships and get married. Because it's a hope for every child to actually be in a relationship and get married and sometimes have children. And we, we also intend to improve the quality of services at the facilities and also in the communities. By this statement, we mean that we want to create linkages between the communities coming starting from the caregiver, the peer supporters, and the facilities, the staff that are working at the facilities. We have to have a common understanding on the needs of young people, adolescents, and even pediatrics, the children who are actually from the ages of zero to nine. These people, they are also part of the community and we have to understand them. And also by having this quality, this um, peer supporters, it's actually very good just because they can easily translate issues to a language that everyone can actually understand, even the children that they talk to, they'll feel open to understand and talk about issues. We are also very good community mobilizers. 
and advocates. We can actually go into the communities and mobilize yeah, other young people, which is actually different. You send someone who is from an older generation to mobilize. And by advocating, we are very good advocates just because we know what we want. We want to address issues on our, in our own way, not other people addressing our issues because there's no other person who is actually better equipped to express, express a situation than the person who has been or is in the situation. So sometimes it may feel challenging for service providers to actually get us involved. Yes, we understand that. Uh, because some of us may ask so many questions, as we learn. If we don't understand, we ask. And it may still be um, a challenge because we are still de developing skills, specific skills. If you're a peer supporter, you have some skills, not all skills. So sometimes we need assistance in developing these skills, leading to more questions. And also, as young people, we may feel shy because it's different because of the environment. And also we are actually trying to figure out how we can actually survive and live a fruitful, sexually fruitful life. And also, may, we may have a lot of priorities. Uh, so we can have to work in certain hours and not every hours because we also have to add, do other chores and provide for our families because as young people also we are some of us come from child-headed families some come come from families where they are only old people and as an adolescent with around 17 18 19 you are the one who is supposed to be cleaning up taking up the house all those kind of stuff and there are so many other issues that we cannot all, all mention right now, but we feel as young people, we have got so much to offer and also we can be a challenge, but please be here with us. But we can be great partners and help to achieve great results. By this, we are actually saying that we understand the issues other young people are facing, so we can help shape services and how we want them delivered because we can translate issues, we can talk about issues and make people understand on a youthful perspective. We know how to speak to our peers to build their knowledge. This is mainly about communication, the kind of communication, the kind of terminology, the kind of language that we speak as young people. Sometimes we use so many jargon that other, other people from different generations can not easily interpret, but when a young person is speaking in that language, we can easily communicate and understand each other. We know how to engage our peers in activities that will encourage them to feel good about themselves. It's also about personal responsibility and capacity building. We can take care of ourselves and themselves by also visiting these facilities to ask questions, to speak up and um, talk about issues when they need help as adolescents. We know where the gaps are and we can speak up and advocate for this so our health facilities are well staffed well resourced and also serve children adolescents and young people very well an example of the work that we are actually doing um for my country i'll take an example from my country which is zimbabwe uh we have got a project that we know as uh, ready which is resilient empowered adolescents and young people living with hiv uh this project is actually working in four countries including zimbabwe um, in this project, we aim to train um, treatment um, supporters, or our, uh, our peers, to work in health facilities and in communities. And we also aim to train health providers on adolescent-friendly services, including psychosocial support and sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, another example that we can actually give, um, which is very good, is the peers to zero project, which is a coalition. Um, this is actually working in Eastern and Southern Africa uh, and in Zimbabwe. Uh, this project is also helping um, the health facilities to improve in quality of services for adolescents and also strengthening adolescents and young people living with HIV in engagement to treatment, uh, uh, HIV treatment and care. So, want to do more with young people that's a question to the world but as from the young people's perspective 
we want to work with you more, the world and the local communities. We want to reach out to youth organizations to identify ways we can actually collaborate and maybe do some fundraising, budget resources to cover our time, transport, and other costs that actually, so that we can actually value our contribution. And we also encourage you as the communities that are that we are working with that are working with us to mentor us, listen to us, and also learn from us. Because it's actually very important that we work together. We share the responsibility as a community, as a whole. This is what I had to share, and uh, thank you very much for listening and um, for a very good day that we're having today. Thank you, Kelly. So we'll open it up for any questions. Uh, we received one earlier. Yes, thanks very much, Jessica. So we have a, a question for Noreen, uh, which is about what lessons has Rexy learned about strengthening parents and carers with HIV to disclose to their children and other family members? And just while Noreen comes around to answer that question, um, we um, welcome any other questions. We're, we're overrunning a little bit. We're going to overrun by five or ten minutes, uh, just to let you know we'll, we're still on for another few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for that question. Um, it's, what I've learned is that... Can everyone hear me? We'll take your silence as yes. meaning that you can hear okay. her. So um, carry on, Noreen. What you have learned is that it is difficult to disclose to children. Uh, the parent is usually concerned about how to how the child will react. Is the child going to be angry? Is the child going to fear? They're concerned about that. They're not sure of how to do it and what to do it. And it also may mean disclosure of their own status. And it's more difficult for parents who have not yet disclosed themselves. So in responding to that, what we've learned is disclosure to children is a process, an ongoing process. You need to know what the child already knows. We need to listen more to the children's questions. We need to, we need to encourage more age-appropriate uh, discussions with the children and age-appropriate disclosure, which is supported by child-friendly methodologies, such as the use of the persona dolls, such as use of play in terms of encouraging disclosure. It is always better for the parents to disclose other than for the child to learn about their status accidentally. So that's what we emphasize as much as possible. And as to the family members, what we have also realized is the family member will say, if I disclose, do I see my family environment as a risk? Do I see them as a resource? And what makes them think it's perceived risk is, do they see stigma, discrimination, or rejection coming from those family members? If they see that, they withhold disclosure. But if they see the family as a resource, as a place where they actually have safety, they feel they're not going to be judged, they can disclose. We always encourage members to start off by disclosing to significant others who can actually be a critical resource for their treatment adherence as well as the retention in treatment. Because at one time or another, they would need that form of support from family members. Thank you very much, Noreen. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that disclosure is a process and is better done um, as a gradual thing, starting early, beginning to introduce the idea of sickness, medicine, and then gradually introducing the idea of HIV. I also mentioned a couple of things. I don't know if they've come up on the um, message board, but, um, but we had a presentation from Cameroon from the Chantal Bia Foundation. And I also mentioned, um, um, the resource Stepping Stones with Children that introduces this concept of early disclosure with younger children. So we only have a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions or any closing remarks to make. I'm quite happy to make a, a, a summary comment about uh, today's presentations. I think that um, what 
we began with hearing was the importance of enabling the top of our brains to operate at, the, at their best. And we do that by creating an environment where we feel safe and secure and trusted. And once we have that sense, we know that we can do a lot. And we know that the youth um, support clinics are a way of creating that environment where children feel supported and children and young people feel able to learn and listen and, and feel um, enabled. We know that young people have huge resources in helping each other to create that sense of a supportive and caring environment. In a way, to summarize, it sounds simple, but what it does come down to is love. If we offer each other love, and if we are able to provide environments where love is strengthened, then in the end, we can support each other through anything that life throws at us. So on that note, I'll hand back to Jessica. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Kate, for co-moderating this uh, webinar. And I'd like to give a sincere thanks uh, to all of our presenters today, to Noreen, to Ruth, to Grace, to Lebega, to Kelvin, um, for being here with us and for sharing some really promising practices um, and uh, sharing your stories, really. So we look forward to our next webinar next month. Um, and we'll let you know, and we will provide all of the presentations and a recording to you so that you can also share this information and disseminate all of this learning to your colleagues and your networks um, so that you can apply these practices and, um, and examples to your settings. So thank you again for participating and being here with us and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.